Steph, I'm almost ready with the next batch of cookies. Uh, just need to put some egg wash on them. Can you check if the other ones come out of the oven already? Uh, honestly, I'm not the household Christmas cookie expert. <laughs> I think this is more of a uh, German tradition, but let me have a look. Wait! Don't open the oven! Then how am I supposed to check whether they're done or not? Look, this oven has a glass door. Yeah, okay, I, I see that, <laughs> but that's not quite the view I'm looking for. How about this? We'll just trust in the baking process and the time provided in the recipe. Has the timer gone off yet? It could be that I didn't set oh. the timer. <laughs> you had one job, but whatever. Let's just take them out already. Uh, I'm sure they'll be edible, and if not, they will be your cookies. <laughs> Whew, that was a uh, <laughs> tense baking episode in the kitchen. I mean, that's what cooking and baking during the holidays can sometimes be like, right? Well, what could help is, uh, believe it or not, artificial intelligence. AI in your oven. That's what we're exploring today. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. Baking, you know, when I think about baking, I always have like a bit of a uh, kind of twofold uh, feeling to it. On one side, I find it really fun because I do have a Christmas tradition with my, let's say, um, cousin. And we bake and bake and bake for a whole day. And so we end up having 300, 400 cookies because we need to send them out also to friends and family. Um, and that's really fun because I get to, you know, ice the cookies as well and decorate them and eat the icing as well. But then when I think about baking a cake for my birthday, you know, German traditions, we have to bring our own birthday cakes to work. <laughs> That's right. Then I dread it so much because always I follow the recipe and always the cakes turns out different. So I don't know how I feel about it. But Jeff, do you like to bake? Well, when I'm in the kitchen, I'm more on the artistic side <laughs> rather than on the <laughs> scientific side. And I do find baking needs to be rather precise. Mm hmm. To be honest, ovens are somehow that black process box for me. I mean, you know, you, you put something in and it's kind of hands off uh, until it's either done or not. And then if you're bringing something out and it's, it's not done, it's kind of a painful experience to try and make it right. So, yeah, maybe I'm more of a chef than a baker. You would close the door, hope that... What you choose as temperature and time somehow fits to what your expectation is, and then it's just hoping. As you can hear, our guest Patrick Schiebeck feels similarly. With cooking, you have a lot of flexibility. You can just adjust everything as you go until the very last minute. You have a lot more control, and you can see what's going on. If you fry something in the pan, it's easier. Yeah? You can look, you can just have a check, but... If you always open the door on the oven, you know that it has an effect on your results. Patrick, however, really shouldn't be wary of ovens, exactly. He actually develops electronics at BSH, a Bosch subsidiary that makes household appliances. I have to do with ovens nearly every day. They shouldn't be intimidating to me. And they aren't because I know what's going on inside of all that stuff. And a lot of what he does is actually making ovens less unpredictable and helping amateurs, like yours truly, get to the perfect <laughs> results every time. Uh, so I won't need to remind you about the door. Exactly. <laughs> we have several sensors that help you supporting your, let's say, cooking adventure. And also with our latest new oven range, we introduced also a camera, which you also could use as a sensor but it also gives you the possibility to look inside your oven from everywhere. A camera in the oven, that's, that's pretty neat. You just open the Bosch Home Connect app and you can have a look at what's going on inside your oven. And you can even create videos and share your baking process on social media. But I think what we're here for is learning more about the other use case that Patrick just mentioned. You could use the camera as a sensor, he said. That's right. Once you have a camera in the oven, you can use it for all kinds of interesting things. You could, for instance, use the camera as a browning sensor. Meaning you don't need to select, let's say, a temperature and a time. You just select your browning degree 
of your cooking good. And the oven is doing everything around that by, let's say, checking the picture and trying to reach the browning value that you selected. If I'm not mistaken, I've seen this. That's something that is already on the market, right? It's true. You can buy ovens with individual browning already. Uh, Patrick has more ideas about how to use the camera as a sensor, but let's stick with browning for a minute and let's have a look behind the scenes. If you start, the oven then takes a picture every 10 seconds. It provides these pictures to the AI service and the AI service then is calculating, let's say, how far your selected browning level is reached by, let's say, comparing to what we labeled in our application lab. The AI service is running on the oven, so the pictures are analyzed right there in your kitchen. And the AI can do that because it's been trained with labeled pictures where experts rated the browning on a scale from one to five. And of course, that's a challenge in and of itself. Mm -hmm. If you have like a process of a bun that gets browned and you give this cooking process or the pictures of that cooking process to 100 different people, <laughs> you will get, I think, 110 different labels. Mm, yep. I was kind of also going to think in that direction. I mean, if you and I got together and we were making pizzas, I don't know if the two of us could actually even agree on what a perfectly baked pizza looks like. I mean... I really like We don't my... need to agree, Shuko. I'm from <laughs> Chicago, where we have experts on pizzas. Okay. And you're some European hybrid, so I'm not sure. Excuse me, our neighbors <laughs> are Italy, and I would say that that is where pizzas originated. But... Ah, yes, but there's always room for innovation. Fortunately, Patrick didn't ask you and me. Mm -hmm. If something is level one, three, or five, he asked actual experts. His engineering team works with chefs and food scientists who have a much better eye for the subtle changes that a food item shows during the baking process. And they actually considered much more than just the degree of browning. It's not only about the browning level, especially for level one and level five, we also defined other parameters. For level one, for example, it doesn't help if your bun is, is light enough, it also should be cooked through. So. We also needed to make some adaptions to the labeling to ensure that your cooking good is done. And also for level five, you could say like, we just nearly burn it, yeah, but actually it should be eatable. So level five would be short of food being burnt. I suppose it makes sense, but I mean, who, I wouldn't choose level five, but maybe some people do like that taste. Judge not on matters of pizza, <laughs> lest you be judged. Yeah, they're all those people. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. I really know a lot of them who nearly burned their pizza. I promise. Nice of the AI to still let them have their pizza their way. It perfectly matches individual preferences. Of course it does. The idea is for the AI to assist you, not to necessarily dictate how your pizza should be. Mm -hmm. What I do find especially interesting just like the human experts that consider more than only browning, the AI doesn't only evaluate the color of what it sees in the pictures either. It doesn't just look at the pizza crust to determine when the pizza has reached the desired state. So the source for the AI is actually the whole picture. Huh? So it tracks what changes. And of course, also in the cooking process, for example, the size changes. Yeah, so... If you have a pizza, it gets bigger at some point in time, and then it gets brown. Also, maybe for a bun. Also, in the end, you have like a little shrinking effect and all that stuff. And of course, that's all a part of what the AI is doing. So it's not just looking plain at the color. There are definitely also other parameters that are checked. But for the user, it's fortunately quite simple. Just select from the menu on the oven how far you would like your pizza cooked. So you have five different levels to select. Um, you also have like a preview picture to have an impression how it will look like. And then you just click start. I find it fantastic that you actually have some sort of degree of reference that you can kind of look at. AI is built on reference. True. Not, not just AI, to be honest. It's, it's all machine learning, no? Yes. I wonder about the opposite, though. Some of the best pizzas I've had were baked in an oven that had no AI in them. I mean, they didn't even have a single dial to adjust the temperature. Do we have time for a little tangent? 
always. If you want to learn something about pizza, there's one guy you should call up, and it's definitely this guy. My name is Scott Wiener, and I run a company called Scott's Pizza Tours that takes people on tours of pizzerias all around New York City. Mr. Wiener? New York City, it's giving you a run for your money, Jeff. <laughs> no, not even close. <laughs> So Scott, Mr. Wiener really should be in the hot dog business. I, I was about to say the same thing, where <laughs> buns actually also come into play. <laughs> so Scott has done this for more than 15 years now in one of the pizza capitals of the world. So I would say he knows a thing or two about pizza. And also, let's say, from personal experience as well. Ah, uh, yeah, I eat a lot of pizza. <laughs> I need some metrics here. When we say a lot, what do we mean? I So I limit myself to 15 slices per week. Woo! So by the end of the week, if I've had less than 15, then like, all right, good, I came in under. But if I had more, then I subtract double the amount that I went over the limit from the next week. That sounds strict. I don't know how you hold yourself to that. Yeah, well, I have to keep myself in check. When Scott gets himself a slice of pizza, he doesn't just pick up a delicious meal. He sometimes also picks up a new insight about how the different pizzerias bake their pies. So here's what he knows about how to control an oven that has no controls. That's coal-fired ovens and wood-fired ovens. In a coal-fired oven, but usually not in a wood-fired oven, you do have a damper which controls the opening in the flue. So that's the exhaust for the oven. The larger the opening, the more air can flow out. The smaller the opening, the less air can flow out. So that's your way of controlling how fast your coal burns and how heat flows through the oven. With a wood-fired oven, your only means of control is the size of the flame and in some ways the location of the flame. So you can get a hotter oven by placing the flame on the side than you would by placing the flame along the back wall. And there are a few other parameters too. For instance, what type of wood you use has an influence on the heat. Also, you need to figure out where your oven has its hot spots and its cold spots. But often, wood fire ovens just get too hot and your pizza will burn on the outside and still be raw inside. But as usual, there's a trick that pizza makers use. That's true. You can cool down the oven by baking flat doughs, essentially. And some pizzerias will do that. They'll make sandwiches. And the way you do that is you just bake an untopped pizza dough, and that dough inflates. And now that gives you like a pita. It's, got, it's a little bread that you can stuff with whatever you need. So if I needed to cool down the floor of the oven, I'd probably do that. That's clever. Mm -hmm. And since this is our holiday episode, I'm a little surprised that we're talking about pizza so much. <laughs> I don't associate pizza with holidays. Uh, what do you think? Well, we did start with talking about baking Christmas cookies, Jeff, um, but I agree. Let's set the mood. Music, please. <laughs> uh, no, I, a little more Christmas, please. Yeah, I like that one. Thank you. Scott says that many Americans order pizza the night before a holiday, like the day before Thanksgiving or the day before Christmas. Those are the big pizza delivery nights of the year. Right, Jeff? I absolutely can affirm that. <laughs> and some people might even enjoy holiday-themed pizzas. So there's definitely a pumpkin spice pizza, which is like, you know, your pumpkin squash puree with nutmeg and, you know, all, all the, these like very American Thanksgiving-y spices. But I've never seen a Christmas pizza. You know, like there's certain holidays that that doesn't happen. Although now that I'm thinking about it, I'm pretty sure there's a place, there's a place in Brooklyn and every year I'm pretty sure they do a Hanukkah pizza and I don't remember what's on it, but I think it's like onion laid out in the shape of a Hanukkah for Hanukkah. I think it's pretty funny. Shuko, somehow that, that brings up a question for me. Which of the winter holidays do you celebrate? Uh, well, it's a bit weird because I don't really celebrate anything. For me, uh, the winter holidays means mostly family because I'm a Buddhist and we don't really celebrate Christmas. But obviously when we were younger... It kind of was celebrated because of, you know, kids get 
presents and we didn't want to, or my parents didn't want us to feel left out. So for us, there is Christmas, but I would say it's lost the Christmassy value and is more a time of a family time. But how about yourself? Got it. Uh, for me, my family is very strong on the Christmas traditions. I can imagine. I can see that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So my family is very strong on the traditional Christmas traditions. So, you know, trees, uh, stockings hung by the mantle with care, all that good stuff. I already spent uh, the weekend putting up our Christmas lights on the house. So, you know, risking my life just so that the house can look festive for a couple weeks. I'm quite proud of it this year. But um, I need to ask you, even if uh, you don't practice it so much, uh, you can still kind of ideate. Um, what would you put on a Christmas pizza? Well, funnily enough, I think we don't. So even though we don't celebrate Christmas, we do decorate and have like a special meal and stuff. And we make a Christmas tree charcuterie board. Um, so <laughs> it starts with like cheese and then a layer of a salami and then some olives. And it just looks like a like a Christmas tree at the end. And I think I would go maybe in that direction for a Christmas pizza. Or I'd have to go completely crazy and make it a sweet pizza. There you go. And then go. I'd probably have like a gingerbread base um, with, a, with a little bit of icing and maybe some yes. chocolate or some s'mores. You know, you could go towards like a s'mores pizza. Yes. I'm much more going in that direction as well <laughs> on the sweet over savory side of a Christmas pizza. I thought so as well. But um, by the way, if you were weird enough to give someone a pizza as a uh, as a Christmas present, let's say, you'd have to find the perfect box for it, right? And I think Scott can help us with that as well. Yeah, it's true. I have the Guinness World Record for the largest collection of pizza boxes, and I even wrote a book all about pizza box art called Viva La Pizza, The Art of the Pizza Box, that came out 10 years ago. Wild. Wow. Uh, I think... <laughs> wow. Yeah, uh, truly, because I think this is uh, special, aside from being special for, for Scott, mm -hmm. I think this is special for us because I don't believe we've had a legitimate world record holder on the show before. No, we haven't. We've had some some athletes and some... But Did no. our axe thrower have, have a record? I, I was wondering somehow. as well. I was thinking of her. That's why I was thinking about it. But but we'll, we'll have to double check. But there's one small, small detail. But I don't eat pizza out of boxes. I, I kind of refuse to because <laughs> the box is detrimental to the quality of the pizza. Everybody knows it. I don't necessarily agree with this. I think I do like eating it out of a box, but... Um, there you have it. Not just out of a box, like when it's like lying on my stomach, like I'm a big <laughs> otter. I'm mean, going to just shovel it into my face. Well, uh, but so there you have it. If you want the perfect pizza, you'd either have to go to a pizzeria and have it right there, or you could freshly bake it at home. Perhaps with the support of AI to get it just right. Well, Patrick likes to use his AI-enabled oven often, but not always. We, we often use just the browning sensor when the kids come from school, put in a pretzel and you just let the oven do its thing and it's done when it's done. So that's, that's really the cool part where it's supporting you in your everyday life. And if you want to cook something really cool in the evening for your wife or together with friends, you still have this option, of course. If you want to experiment, if you want to get to know your oven a little better, if you want to play around with bake times or temperatures, you can still do that. The AI just adds an assistive function for those times when you don't want to bother and just need the oven to do its job. And there's more of that coming. Next year, we want to bring a food recognition. Food recognition. Food recognition. Another use case for the camera and the AI in the oven. The idea is that the oven automatically understands what it is you're cooking and immediately suggests the right oven setting. Here's how it works. Actually, it even starts with opening the door. So we set some parameters for the camera with opening the door. And after you close it, we then take a picture. This picture is sent to the AI service directly. It's calculating, let's say, through the image and Within, I think currently we're within 800 milliseconds, you get the result from the AI service. This result then is taken back again to, let's say, the oven domain and the GUI. What is the GUI? Graphic user interface. Thank you. Learn something new again. That's what we're here for. And then the GUI searches for 
the right program inside, let's say, the repository of the oven itself. And if there is something found, it gives you the options. Depending on, on the mapping we as, let's say, development team did before. Okay, if I got this right, I put, what's something Christmassy? Um, Pizzas. Yeah, I mean, I mean an ingredient. <laughs> I think many people in Germany have duck or goose for Christmas. Mm -hmm. yep. um, so I, I'll, let's say I'll put a goose in the oven. The oven takes a picture, analyzes it and recognizes that it's poultry. It pulls up the program from roasting a bird on the screen, and I can go from there. Now I press start. Right. Ovens have been coming with such programs for years now, but you might not actually know that your oven has a program for roasting a goose, for example. So the AI helps surfacing that, and again, helps you achieve a better result. So currently we can recognize about 43 dishes. I think officially it's 42 dishes plus the empty oven. I think it's most of the vegetables, you know, like broccoli, carrots, cauliflower, different types of cakes, pizza, casseroles, lasagna, tartflambe, different styles of bread and bread rolls, croissants, pretzels, of course. I mean, we're a Bavarian company, <laughs> so we definitely need to recognize pretzels. But how do you say it in German, Jeff? Because pretzels is the American way. Don't tease me. I'm not teasing you. Pretzel. Just hear Pretzi. Yes, there we go. I love it when you say it. <laughs> so I understand pretzel are very important. But what about the Christmas cookies we wanted to bake, Jeff? Not yet, I think. So maybe I really need to check the list. But I think we don't have like the really the, the classical cookies, you mean, for baking for Christmas. But... I mean, of course, in combination with browning, this really could be a pretty nice use case uh, to deliver for maybe Christmas next year. Ah, what has to happen to make this dream come true? I'd say it would be one stress factor less in our kitchen. Indeed it would. And of course, as always with these things, it all comes back to good data. Which means also you have to prepare a lot of cookies. <laughs> That's right. I love that this is a job within Bosch. Let's prepare a load of cookies to get good data. <laughs> we need that uh, ground truth. Patrick and the teams working on this functionality in Germany and Spain, they need images. Mm -hmm. Dozens and dozens of images of raw cookies on a baking sheet inside an oven. But before you start baking, you also need to talk to some people and be very clear about what you actually want the oven to recognize. Which cookies do you want to recognize? This you need to define together with our colleagues in the application lab. So I think you somehow need to find out which cookies have similarities in, let's say, the parameters uh, for the cooking process itself. Or if it's like really a specific one, you also could say for, I don't know, gingerbread, maybe you say we really make an own dish for gingerbread. Uh, so. This definitely is a decision you need to take. And afterwards, it's all about generating the pictures for the AI. And that really sounds like a lot of work because as Patrick has already said, cookies can come in so many different shapes and sizes. And I suppose it could be very difficult to cover them all. That's true. And to be honest, the internet at large doesn't offer much help either. Because images from things like cookbooks or recipe blogs or whatever don't actually make much of a contribution. It would actually be really good to have pictures from inside a Bosch oven. So you could get them from Bosch ovens. Every oven that has a camera and is paired to the Home Connect app is sending all the pictures to our backend every time you as a customer start a heating mode. So if you cook something with top bottom heating, we get the pictures every minute at the back end. And with these pictures for, I would say, faster analyzers, small videos get created. And also you get some more data like which program was used, which temperature the oven had in the beginning, which temperature it had at the end, 
So we get all that data coming within the metadata of the picture. And this is all gathered in this tool and can be used for further analysis. That helps the engineering team to improve the AI, to make the existing recognition better and better, but also build up new training sets for teaching the AI about more foods, cookies, for example. But wait, <laughs> rewind. The camera in my oven is sending pictures of my baking failures to a Bosch server somewhere. Well, yes, and that's no secret. Uh, of course, we're very transparent about our data processing. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, when your camera is active, you can see a camera icon actually on the display of the oven. And of course, you can always turn this off. At the back end, we don't know who sent the data. So Patrick might see our burnt cookies, but he doesn't know that the images are coming from our oven. That's correct. And this is a pretty common practice in a lot of smart and connected appliances mm -hmm. these days. For example, highly likely that your television set is doing something similar. Hearing the sound, it, the ambient sound in your room, and reporting that back to ultimately do dynamic adjusting for your audio. Very standard stuff. But this data collection could really help building a good training data set for cookie recognition. And we maybe see now that a lot of people for Christmas doing a lot of cookies. Then um, our guys from Application Lab see, ah, oh, we got a lot of pictures of cookies in the last weeks. Let's make a cookie dish for that. Ultimately meaning a program for the oven with settings for cookie baking and an AI model that can recognize cookies. Parfait. I'm looking forward to that. And even if they decide not to teach the AI about cookies, I think it's great that kitchen appliances like ovens, and you mentioned it before, uh, Jeff, are getting smarter and that they get updated with AI. I think it takes some of the unpredictability out of baking. Yeah, definitely. Predicting stuff like this is exactly where the value contribution of AI comes in. After all, mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's lowering a barrier. Uh, I think baking, roasting, using the oven right, generally speaking, can be a challenge. Mm. And so if AI is helping me get the most out of the oven, or perhaps getting a start with baking in the first place, that's great. We can uh, try and see if we can sneak Melina's uh, grandmother's, what was it again? Uh, cake or uh, cheesecake. <laughs> 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 or is the best feature of all of that that you don't need to open the oven door anymore because you can just check the camera. Well, actually. Yeah, if your selected level was reached, the process is finished, the oven switches off the heating, and you get a push notification also on the app because it is actually pretty important to open the door and take out your goods because, of course, the remaining heat inside the oven would dry out your product and also would brown them more, which then if you take it out like five minutes later, then we may not fit to the level you selected. Okay, so that's not available yet, that the oven opens the door once it's done. Fine, we'll wait for it. Anyways, Patrick has described so many ways a modern oven can support us in the kitchen and help us achieve perfect results through automation. I think my kitchen needs an upgrade. And if you're still looking for a Christmas gift for me, Jeff, uh, let me think about that. <laughs> but in the meantime, I wish you wonderful luck and much success with your cookie baking. And of course, happy holidays. Happy holidays to you too, Jeff. And soon after that, I'll come and visit you in the States. That's right. We'll be seeing each other in Las Vegas, where we have a very special show planned at CES, the Consumer Electronics Show. At the Bosch booth, we'll present from Know How to Wow live in Las Vegas. Las Vegas. It's going to be a live episode with some special guests, a lot of fun and games, and of course, know-how and a lot of wow. If you, dear listener, happen to be at CES, come by the Bosch booth on January 10th. We're definitely looking forward to meeting you. And if you're not at CES, you'll find the show we record right there, here as well, in your podcast app and also on YouTube. Bye for now, and happy holidays. Joyeux Noël, or whatever you're celebrating, everybody. Have a good one. From know-how to wow. The Bosch Global Podcast. 
there will be one more episode before the year ends. With me, Jeff's voice avatar. I will be bringing you a deep dive episode as a belated holiday gift. Look for it in this podcast feed if you don't want to miss your monthly dose of deep tech.